Bridge is an acronym for books recycled to instruct, disciple, guide, and educate. We firmly believe that reading is critical for Christians to grow in their faith, and so we strive to make Bibles and gospel-based Christian books available at very affordable prices. Our purpose is to share the glorious good news of Jesus Christ through written and spoken word. We do this by providing resources and educational opportunities for people to grow in their knowledge of biblical truth so that they are equipped to share that truth with others. You can visit our website at bridgebookstexas.org where you can find our Reformed podcast, Bridge Radio, where we bring on Christian authors, apologists, and scholars such as Dr. James White, Dr. John Frame, Joe Beaky, Jeff Durbin, John Sampson, and Tim Trumpert. You can find Bridge Radio on iTunes, Android, Windows, and Google Play or stream via our website. Thank you and enjoy the podcast. who believed were together and had all things in common and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing their proceeds to all as any had needed acts 2 verses 44 through 45 and welcome back to another episode of bridge radio coming at you from the great state of texas proclaiming the gospel fearlessly and faithfully i'm your host as always julio amad rodriguez you can call me july and across from me i don't have my co-host aw varilla he's actually driving back from the valley of texas to here as we speak he's a very busy individual and now him and his wife are business owners so uh that's the reason why he could make it on this podcast today but he'll be on the next one uh for our listeners please keep them in prayer that god would give them wisdom guidance and counsel and uh they're just two christians that i uh highly look up to and uh yeah like i said they're business owners and just please keep them in your prayers but uh aw will be back on next week Uh, but today i'm very excited for our topic for today as we teased on the last podcast Um, We're going to be talking about socialism. Does the Christian worldview uh, give justification for the economic uh, principle um, as well as the scriptures? And so we're going to be talking about this. We have a a guest who's been on the program before, and he wrote a book titled God Versus Socialism. And so I'll be introducing him in just a moment. Uh, But uh, if you're listening to this podcast uh, on whatever platform that you're listening on, please subscribe. We're on iTunes, Android, Windows, Google Play. And uh, we're finally uh, excited to announce we have a bridge app uh, developed by Subsplash and myself. And uh, you can go on there. You're going to have articles, Bridge Radio, uh, some of our conferences and our teachings. And there's a lot more to come. I'll unpack that on a uh, on a different podcast. You could also listen to our previous podcast. This is episode 50, so we have 49 to go look at uh, and to go listen to. We've had Christian scholars, apologists, uh, talking about a wide range of topics. We recently did a uh, Doctrine of Grey series where we had John Frame, James White, Jeff Durbin come on and unpack all of that, as well as Rosario Butterfield come on and talk about her book, uh, The Gospel Comes with a House Key. Excellent podcast, so we recommend for you all to go listen to that. Um, And uh, if uh, you want to give and support this uh, amazing ministry, you could visit us at www.bridgebookstexas.org. Click our about slash giving page, and uh, you could go ahead and support us there. We are a Reformed Christian bookstore and coffee shop. And uh, we're just dedicated to uh, discipling and, and uh, equipping Christians for uh, evangelism and uh, giving them uh, or, or letting them understand what they believe, why they believe it, and uh, obviously how to share the gospel. Um, but anyway, let's go ahead and dive into our um, into our topic for today. Uh, like I said at the beginning of the program, our guest has appeared before. He uh, His recent book, uh, which we had him on, was uh, titled The Problem of Slavery in Christian America. It's a book I highly recommend for, for people to go read. Um, he's the president of American Vision, and he's authored more than 20 books and has been featured in several audio and video lectures on various topics of apologetics, church history, and economics, which we're going to be talking about today. Uh, he's written a book titled God Versus Social. Socialism, and it's a very, very, very relevant topic today as uh, socialism almost seems to be a fad. And so uh, just thank you so much, Dr. Joel McDermott, for coming on to the program, brother. Again. Yeah, it's my pleasure. 
Yeah. So this is a, a kind of weird confession I'm, I'm, I'm going to make to you, and I was kind of debating on whether I should let you know this, but um, I, I have this weird, what if I was ever given the opportunity to uh, direct a, a Pixar film, uh, a Disney film, so more of an animation, uh, animated film, and, uh, and I love Western films, by the way, so I have this, what if I was ever given the opportunity to do a Western animated film, and so as people know, uh, you don't bring on actual people uh to 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 come on to to uh to the animated film uh obviously because it's animated but you get people to play voices so whenever i come across people who have very unique interesting voices i sort of cast them into this what if animated film and uh the first time i ever heard you in your debate with jd hall um uh, on theonomy and the first time i was listening to you i go you know what this guy would be a very good voice for the main character or a sheriff (laughs) (laughs) for my film nice i'm well i'm flattered but i'm i'm just hoping it happens because i'd like to sign that contract (laughs) (laughs) well if i ever was given the opportunity man i'll I'll go ahead and let you know but that's just uh, (laughs) something very weird about me i I come across uh people with very interesting voices and whenever i come across them i'm like they would play that character uh in my animated film so just something weird about me man anyway so um yes socialism as we're diving into this topic today um, I've come across a lot of people who really don't know what socialism is. Uh, it could be because they just really never um, uh, properly understood it. And, uh, and so I just wanted to give the opportunity at the beginning of this podcast to, uh, for you to answer the question of what is socialism and really how does it compare to uh, capitalism, uh, more of a free market? Well, that's a great question, and it's often debated. Um, I, the way I deal with it in the book is this. Okay, technically, when you, if you try to use that term, say, oh, hey, Bernie Sanders, for example, is a socialist, you'll hear uh, opposition from the left and say, well, no, 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 not technically, because the technical definition of socialism is the state owns the means of production. Mm -hmm. Okay. And well, okay, in that sense, he's not a socialist. And so they'll say, well, then you can't claim a socialist. Right now, currently, by the way, the right is doing the same thing Hmm. when people call Trump a fascist. (laughs) <laughs> or say this is something's fascism. Oh, no, no, that's not the technical definition mm-hmm. of fascism. Um, and actually, I think Dinesh D'Souza's movie is making that point now. It's actually the left. Fascism is a leftist idea. Huh. Well, okay, That the, the problem with all of that is it really gets into the weeds quickly, and we've got all kinds of you know, technical caveats mm-hmm. laying aside. When I talk about socialism, particularly from the, the perspective of the Bible and in my book, it is... It is the negation of private property. Okay. Okay. It, I don't care if you do it to the nth degree, like some communist, like the, the most radical communist, or if you do it just a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, when the state starts interfering in the ownership and use of private property, and that's when I say, okay, this is socialism. And I, I now that may be too radical for some people right. toward you know something like a libertarian. Mm-hmm. concept but that's where i stand and i think that's what the bible means you know thou shalt not steal applies to everybody including governments mm-hmm. so you know if you take it in a very simple perspective god has always been a god of private property and he has delegated that to mankind he did it when man sinned he kicked him out of the garden of eden mm-hmm. and he put up a divine no trespassing sign in the form of a angel with a flaming sword Hmm. Okay, you cannot cross this boundary. And that's what private property is about. It's a boundary you're not allowed by authority to cross. And so that was God's no trespassing sign, and that's where we kind of learn that concept. From that point on, Mm -hmm. we find people uh, either delegated by God himself to a particular plot of land, Mm -hmm. Or you find him giving explicit commandments for us to live in that way. So certainly by the time you get to Moses, you have the direct uh, commandment, thou shalt not steal. But you also have that applied to uh, property boundaries as well. Mm -hmm. In Deuteronomy and other places, you were not even allowed to move the landmark that marked the corner of your property from your neighbors. If you did, you were stealing property. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, You know, and there are other case examples like that. So this is the bottom line for me. When you start talking about the state can tell you what to do with your property or it can tax you on your property or it can distribute property from some people and give it to others. Uh To me, you're into the broad umbrella realm of what is called socialism. 
and that is, uh, to me, an infraction of the biblical precept. Okay. So what would be the difference between um, Hitler's view of socialism and, and uh, sort of the communists that, that he was fighting? Uh, you said even just a little bit of socialism to the umpth degree. If you could kind of unpack that for us, just the difference between socialism and communism. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously there are different forms of state socialism, especially when it becomes enshrined at the government, at the civil government level. Mm -hmm. So today, for example, people would classify France, I believe, as a uh, democratic socialist Mm -hmm. uh, republic or something of that nature. I forget what all names they use, but Sweden would be the same way. And, And you may look at it from an academic perspective and say, well, that's not socialism, that's a welfare state. Okay. And again, these are all fine distinctions. To me, they're on a spectrum. So when you had uh, Nazi Germany fighting uh, you know, Soviet Russia, you had socialists fighting socialists in my book. Mm-hmm. And yes, there were differences between what they, what they were doing, mm-hmm. uh, and there were differences in their worldviews. Uh, one of them were national, social, national socialists, the other were international socialists. Okay. Uh, they had different views of nation nationality or ethnicity they had different views of this or that they had different views of of uh, uh probably of uh, like tariffs and production and those types of things being national or not mm-hmm. uh, so but but in the big picture they share in the idea that it is okay for the civil government to determine these to control people's private property to tell them what they can do with theirs to take money from some people and give it to other state-sanctioned causes, Mm -hmm. whether it's to help feed the poor or to build highways or whatever. Uh, All of that is the big umbrella of socialism. So to me, basically, currently, the whole world is socialist. And and with very, very limited vignettes in history, have we not had some level of socialism? You know, we used to, they used to have a a phrase, what did they call it back in the old days with mm-hmm. the kings and the monarchs? The, they called it mercantilism. Mm-hmm. You know, and this was basically if you were in favor with the royal court, then you could profit off the royal sanctioned businesses and the uh, trading companies and the finance companies and the slave shipments and all that kind of stuff. Uh-huh. Uh, but it was the same thing. It was a state run economy dominated by the civil government. Mm-hmm. And if you wanted to, Uh, prosper in that system you had to get in favor with the civil government Hmm. it it, it's no different to me than in from god's perspective from the perspective of the moral principles of god's law it's no different if you're in nazi germany or in uh, soviet russia or in the welfare state sweden or in the uk with their socialist health care plan mm-hmm. or in Canada or in the U.S. And that's right. where this is where it really comes home, because uh, not to get ahead of you in any means. But when, right. when we're here, if we ro- really want to be honest with this, we can cry socialist, socialist all day and point at Bernie Sanders or point at John, you know, uh, Vladimir Lenin or whoever else. And but if you're participating in the local public school system, mm-hmm. you are participating in some form of socialism. Okay. And in fact, that's probably the most socialistic institution in our country. The, okay. In that case, the state does own the means of production. I mean, the, right. it's unmistakable in that case. But, you know, our social security system is the same. Our Many of our health care systems are the same. Medicare, um, many of them, many of our systems in general are the same. Okay. Uh, there is socialism there on our watch, and Christians and conservatives not only participate in it, we fight to keep it. Okay. And so that that's where yeah, my yeah. book really hits home is this is, you know, we can criticize those socialists out there all day long, but until we're willing to get real about it for ourselves, mm-hmm. then the sermon's not hitting home. We We need for it to hit home. Yeah. So uh, I know somebody could probably be listening to this podcast and be like, wait, wait a minute, Joe, you're you're against the public school system <laughs> or even social services or maybe e- even universal health care, because all of those from especially from the people I have talked to see that as a as a good thing. And we're all sort of contributing uh, to this. And um, I guess why why would that be bad? Um, you know, is 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 an, an, is an objection uh, that is commonly raised, and so I, I definitely would like your response to that. Absolutely. Well, here's the bottom line: if something is good in society and everybody agrees that it's good, then you should not need taxation to support it. 
Mm-hmm. That's the bottom line. If everybody says this is so good, and it is so good, and it's obvious to everybody, then they should be willing to support it, to pay for it privately, or to support it through public charity. Uh, not public charity, through private charity. <laughs> and so when, when I when I look at the school system in particular, and we don't have to dwell on that, we could dwell even on fire services or a okay. number of other things. The, there is nothing the government does that cannot be done better by the private sector. Hmm with the possible exception of the administration of justice. Hmm. And we could even talk about that, I think, but that's for another discussion. When it comes to the punishment of crime, that is something we don't want the free market doing, or we don't want people, companies having the freedom to do without you know certain types of oversight, legal oversight. Um, but when it comes to education, when it comes to health care, when it comes to social services, when it comes even to fire protection and a mm-hmm. variety of things, there is nothing the government can do that cannot be done better in a competitive free market. And this is proven over and over again okay. in, in every area of life. I mean, just take health care, for example. Mm-hmm. You know, Christians and conservatives understand this when it comes to health care. We were the ones crying the hardest and the loudest when Obamacare, the push for Obamacare, was was coming. Mm-hmm. And we were fighting against single-payer system. We were fighting against government takeover of health care. And what was the main thing we all said? This is not the government's job, right. and the private sector can do it better. Mm-hmm. Now, I'll, I'll admit, be the first one to admit, there's a lot of corruption in the private sector. Well, okay, that's the government's job. Go fight the corruption. Hmm. And let the free market be truly free based on moral principles. But th- it doesn't mean the government needs to take it over. When the government takes it over, people lose choices, prices go up, you have all kinds of pro- – wait times go up, quality goes down. It's That has been proven in every place it's been ever tried. Hmm. And so why why would you want this in the case of healthcare? Well, take the same thinking – Something we know is true, it's obvious, it's easily provable, and go apply it to education. Huh. Go apply it to the other areas in which uh, our government has, com- our governments, plural, have complete control. And it seems radical to us at first because when it comes to something like education, we've never had a time in our lifetimes when it wasn't a government function. Huh. So we don't have any frame of reference for anything else. We just assume education, that's something the government does. That's something the government provides. And our governments themselves tell us, oh, this is one of the greatest interests of state is education. Mm-hmm. And so we listen to our government tell us that we need more government. Mm-hmm. Isn't that the way it always works? Uh, but historically, this was not the case. Uh, in America, there were no public schools before 1830. <laughs> yeah. You know, there there were no, with very, very few exceptions, there were no government-funded uh, educational institutions mm-hmm. before 1830. And then mm-hmm. they started to ramp up in the 1830s. But even after that, even up into the late 19th century, you did not have a wide proliferation of public education facilities. Huh. And yet... In most cases, literacy rates matched those of other places in the world. Huh. Now, obviously, there's a lot of issues in there. I've written the book on slavery, so I know all the history behind that. It's mm-hmm. terrible. Uh, but but again, that is a government-imposed system. You get the government out of that system, and you let people be free, and those slaves would have been taught to read. They would have been educated, and they would have been trained in skills, and that would have been solved. The same thing is true of education, and I think it's true pretty much across the board. Uh, the government, and I think one thing that I do want to be clear for our listeners is, you know, Joel and I uh, aren't this anarchist who believe that there should be absolutely no government. We, we do believe that God established government for a purpose, and uh, and I wanted to ask Joel, you know, what, what is really the responsibility of the government? Yeah, you're asking about the civil government yes. specifically. Yes, yes. Uh, because there are different types of government mm-hmm. that, that aren't based on coercion the civil government is the only institution that's based on coercion um, well the the family has that right too with the the disciplining of children uh, but when it comes to the civil government the only uh, the only role it should have per scripture is the punishment of crime mm-hmm. 
Okay. So that comes into the administration of justice, the uh, organizing and the administration of courts, which also I think much of that can be taken care of privately, especially among Christians. Huh. But uh, the administration of justice and due process and the punishment of crime. So it, it, that pertains to the enforcement of private property, the enforcement of contracts, the enforcement of marriage contracts, um, you know, in, in cases of tort, whether it's uh, – a bodily injury or bodily mm-hmm. attacks, assaults, or or even murders or rapes or whatever, those all fall under the heading of what is the civil government here for? It is here to take care of those things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so, you know, how can those things be funded? That's an open question to me. Um, but when you start talking about taxation of privacy, uh, private private property, mm-hmm. in order to fund education or to fund other things. To me, that is crossing the line into what we what I would call socialism, uh, broadly defined. Yes. So, but the government, the, certainly there's a certain, there's a role for the civil government, but there's a greater role for family government, for the free market, which is essentially a government under God, mm-hmm. uh, governed by moral rules and business ethics. And then mm-hmm. there's a church government Mm-hmm. And those those are the primary institutions in society, according to Scripture. The civil government is kind of a last uh, last resort backup for when people don't follow the rules, mm-hmm. when people do harm other people, when people do steal from other people. It is there to bring restitution mm-hmm. and rectitude to those situations. Uh, but when we talk about government, we need to have that larger scope so that we realize the greater responsibility, the greater emphasis on Scripture is on the free market in among men, s- such that there are family governments, and not to mention self-government and uh, church governments and private institutions. Um, all of those things work as governments. You can have, I mean, in the, in the Middle Ages, mm-hmm. even, you had a tremendous network of private governments that governed the markets and so if you had you know disputes among you know shipping companies or disputes among merchants of different sorts they handled their own problems and it was a system that was very effective if a man cheated and he got caught he he knew he would lose his entire livelihood and reputation among his his peers and so that didn't dare happen. And when there were mistakes or infractions, they went and met privately in courts. They had their own bylaws, and they abided by them. Uh, these kinds of things certainly can be done again today. And, um, you know, we, we the, the simple fact is it's one thing to, to run down socialism, but you you really, in order to do that, you got to have the alternative in place, and that is to have a mindset that is positive in terms of freedom and liberty and private cooperation, if you you know you you need to develop that first because that's the positive aspect. The critique of socialism is the negative aspect, and the reason we have so much socialism today and in history is because we neglect to do the other part, which is what Scripture calls us to do: right <laughs> to right. obey God's law, to grow <laughs> up and become mature in Christ, mm-hmm. to love one another, to you know, in certain circumstances, be more willing to be defrauded in order to maintain the freedoms that you have and and the brotherly nature of things. Uh, There's so much to discuss in that regard uh, that socialism came along because men were failing to do that thing and because we were failing in so many regards. And the people who ran the churches and Christian individuals would not change so that there were grievances among workers there were grievances among certain classes of people who were exploited in across the board and when those grievances exist that is those are tools those are footholds for the devil to come along and fan resentment because guess what it is a legitimate grievance Mm-hmm. And when the church and private individuals in society will not address the grievance in a brotherly manner, mm. that becomes a foothold for Satan 
and socialism comes in through those doors. Mm. And it has been very successful in doing so, uh, so that they appeal to that. Now, the other ground, of course, is envy. If you look yeah. over at your neighbor and he has a bigger <laughs> yeah. house and better car than you do, and then Satan whispers in your ear, well, this guy shouldn't have more than you. You deserve more, too. Well, that's just nonsense. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that that doesn't mean that guy is not envious, too, mm-hmm. and that he's not using all kinds of coercive and shady means to get what he's got mm-hmm. and exploiting people. And, it's, and historically, if you don't have mass exploitation, it's very difficult to make any kind of socialist appeal work. There's got to be some kind of uh, grievance there in enough people's hearts to to get a political foothold. Huh. And uh, in, in my opinion, especially after the slavery book, it's always on the backs of the failures of the private Christians to begin with. It's always on the failures of the church's backs mm. that these things come in. Right, right, right. Uh, so, go ahead. According to multiple outlets, uh, kind of just going off of what you were saying, you know, socialism is on the rise. Uh, we have the Chicago Tribune, they wrote an article titled, Why Millennials So Hot for Socialism? And, you know, we have, like you brought up, Bernie Sanders is a huge advocate for, quote, democratic socialists. And then now we have Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez coming in. And, uh, you know, socialism is definitely rising, um, you know, especially amongst a certain, you know, political party. And uh, I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on why do you think it's gaining so much traction today? Well, I mean... Uh, I have mixed thoughts about that in general. Uh, Several things come to mind. First of all, uh, it's only rising, relatively speaking. I mean, okay, in in the 19, what was it? How was it, 20s or earlier? We had an actual socialist party active in the United States, particularly in the upper Midwest and Minnesota and whatnot. We had a socialist candidate for president. Okay, he didn't even put any (laughs) – he didn't even have any adjectives out in front. It wasn't democratic socialist or that or this. It was socialist, all right? It was a socialist party, and his name was Eugene Debs, if I remember correctly, and there were all Uh kinds of ties to other socialist parties. So, I mean, historically, we've had these things. If you look at Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the New Deal Mm -hmm. that gave birth to a lot of the policies we have, and then LBJ, that whole era – there were people drafting proposals for government policy for single-party health care systems in the 1930s already mm-hmm. and 1940s. And these were being, you know, the, the people thought these were going to be proposed and become legislation at that time. These were people that were bureaucrats in the system. I have, there's a great book about it, and some of it's in my other book, Restoring America. Uh, but mm-hmm. the, the point is that administration was strongly socialistic. And if you go back and look at corporate tax rates from that era, you're talking about, in some cases, the corporate tax rates in the highest bracket were way up in the high percentages, like 70%. Mm -hmm. Okay, that (laughs) is completely unthinkable today. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. You know, and when, you know, Trump's tax cuts, whenever they were a while back, Uh got passed, it was what I can't remember the exact percentages, but it was something along the lines of cutting from 32 percent down to 28 percent in the top bracket. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is child's play compared to what we used to have in corporate taxes. So Mm -hmm. is socialism on the rise, really? Mm -hmm. No, I think there's sentiments among some people that are able to get a following among young people mm-hmm. and the truth is there's two things going on there number one is for most of those young people the only frame of reference they have for life is donald trump <laughs> they, they, yeah. they didn't read politics or much politics at all before trump came along yeah. or maybe yeah. obama era right and some of the fights that happened with the tea party and all that so that's their frame of reference right. for for all this stuff, and so you have a, you could easily have someone come along like a Bernie Sanders and mm-hmm. start saying, "Look, the government should make the rich pay their fair share." Correct. Yeah. Everybody calls him a socialist, although <laughs> technically, according to their own definitions, he's not. But it sticks, and all this, all the young people start wearing socialist T-shirts. Right. And then you have this young lady. I can't remember her name. Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Okay. So some. Miss Cortez mm-hmm. uh, has her, you know, socialist thing going, and everybody's repeating it. But she's in one of the most liberal districts in the world. Right. <laughs> I right. mean, <laughs> she's in, you know, this this 
very, very uh, liberal district in New York City, I think. Mm. So that's not that's not an accomplishment. That's not progress. That's not that's not a change, really. Mm-hmm. And and if you look at her policies, they're no different than the people before her. It's just she's more open about we need them. Hmm. And I think in the Trump era, in which you have a lot of the you know talk about tax cuts and those kinds of issues, it's easy to make her become the counterpoint. And here's one more aspect to it. I, I told sure. you I had several thoughts on Go, this. Go shoot for it, man. <laughs> with with the con, with the the social media today, everything is extremely polarized. Yes, yes. You know, and and now the conservatives even have their own TV network because yeah. Fox is not conservative enough. So, mm-hmm. so now you have you know. <laughs> If you want to talk like Phil Robertson, you got to go on CRTV and whatever right, else. And right. All the hardcore conservatives like Michelle Malkin and all them, they make their way over there. <laughs> so now, so that's even more polarized. Right. And on the left is just doing the exact same thing that you're mm-hmm. seeing on the right. So MSNBC comes becomes even more whacked out liberal, and the political parties now you've got a couple candidates in certain districts who are even more outspoken in terms of. Uh, what they want, and they call it socialism. Well, okay, it's still nowhere near what what we had in the past. Uh-huh. Uh, and considering the nature of modern polarized, you know, dichotomized political discussion, it's uh-huh. probably to be expected. So, and it's also funny that that the conservative critics, including myself, have for years now pointed to Obama and said, that's a socialist, that's a socialist. Uh Point to Hillary, said, that's a socialist. And then when one Democratic candidate stands up in the most liberal district in the country and says, hey, I'm a socialist, everybody panics. (laughs) Well, you've been saying it all along. What are you surprised by? You should be thankful that they're being honest finally. Mm -hmm. You should use her as a foil against all the other ones who won't say what they really mean. Right. I mean, there's there's so much to be done with this. It's not even funny, but, but the sad fact is, and this is me being cynical, but also in part being true, too many conservatives are more willing to use her as a as a shock value to get clicks and revenue on their websites mm-hmm. and to get more watches than they are to actually do anything about any of this. Yeah. Because if they were serious about socialism, they would start with the public schools. Mm-hmm. And they don't want to touch that third rail of politics. They don't want to uh, end their career that way. Hmm. So it's easy to point at the Miss Cortezes of the world and say, oh, look how bad she is. Oh, and by the way, like and share and subscribe our website. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I'm not impressed with any of that. And, 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 and I don't think anything will come of it in the big picture in the political realm. It's just it's political theater and it's political drama for clickbait. Correct, correct. So so now off, off the off the idea of it really not being anything that's new. Um, it's not anything that's just currently rising, but has always been. Uh, in your book, you do address just the history of socialistic thinking, where you know the mm-hmm. state is in control of property uh, and the lives of, of people. You know that goes far as back as we go. And, and now, really, what I want to start doing is kind of tail like going into actual scripture, um, you know, and just making a uh, um, sort of a justification off the Bible of it, socialism not being a biblical idea. But uh, yeah, just going back to my point, um, if you could kind of unpack that, where you know. Know, socialistic thinking isn't really anything new, and especially within the last hundred years. If you could talk about that for a moment. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the book starts off with the question, who is king? Mm-hmm. And if you don't answer that question correctly, you're in worlds of trouble. And <laughs> obviously the answer is Christ. Uh, and, and I begin with 1 Samuel 8, if I remember correctly. Uh, keep in mind, I wrote this book, what, 10 years ago now? Mm-hmm. So I, yeah. it's hard to say that I've been doing this for over a decade, but it's happened. <laughs> And I don't have any lines on my face or gray gray hairs to show for it. I promise you. <laughs> no. And uh, so, First Samuel eight is where the leaders come to Samuel and say, "Hey, we want a king like all the other nations." And Samuel says, "No, don't do that. It's not a good idea. Stick with what the law says." And mm-hmm. they say, "No, give us a king like other nations." Samuel's grieved, and God says to Samuel, "Go ahead and give them what they want. It's not you they're rejecting. It's me they are rejecting." But I want you to go and tell them what's going to happen when they have a king like the other nations. Hmm. And that famous passage in 1 Samuel 8, yep. uh, beginning around verse 10 or so, going through the list of the things that would come from having a king like all the nations. And and it included uh, taxation 
at 10 percent include the conscription the conscription of sons and daughters to be government employees and to be military right. uh, conscripts and, and a whole list of other things uh-huh. and it, this was enough to be like a terror to god's <laughs> people and, you know if you can if you can think about that having yeah. a single tax and that 10 percent 10 percent yeah <laughs> as, as a terrorizing of people um <laughs> You know, there's not a single Western nation today that would not have to cut its taxes by at least uh, 75% yeah. in order to get to that in, in total. Right. Uh, it's just crazy. So anyway, <laughs> but that's where it starts. And right. and God considers this judgment. Uh-huh. And that's where I, I start with the book. People have no idea what liberty and freedom are. They don't study the Bible for these purposes, and when they do, they don't really seriously apply them to themselves. They apply it to get rid of their political foe, get rid of the socialism in your life, you know, structure your life so that you can live free. The reason we have all those socialistic candidates is because of this. But anyway, sticking with the Bible, it goes on from there, Uh, and that principle was there with Samuel. So you're looking at, what, 1,000 B.C. or so, maybe 800 mm-hmm. B.C.? and uh, But it was before that because you see it in Egypt. There are stories in Scripture of the conscription and the wealth redistribution and the ownership of all wealth by the state under Pharaoh. Mm-hmm. And we have similar things from all kinds of other pagan nations. The state was considered divine. And therefore, it claimed ownership over the economy, the the land and the production and Mm -hmm. the people, which is, by the way, one reason they could demand human sacrifices Mm -hmm. in pagan cultures. But, uh, you know, that over time, we may have gotten away from the concept that our rulers are the descendants of the gods, Mm -hmm. but we've kept the economic system and the political control of the economy. And we've done, we do that for the same reasons, I think, ultimately, it's fear and a desire to be in control of things. That, and that's socialism. So that's there, you know, 2000 B.C., from the very beginning, 2500 B.C., you can probably take it all the way back to Cain. Mm-hmm. So, it's, of course, it's everywhere. And then it's all through history as well. It right. shows up in the New Testament. Uh-huh. Uh, there are stories all through the Acts. I ask people all time, all the time to sit down and read the book of Acts with an eye specifically toward the governments and the economics of what's going on. Uh-huh. And, you know, suddenly you realize that there's a ton of it in there. You know, when the local guilds get threatened by Paul's preaching the gospel, they organize and drag him before the government in Ephesus hmm. because the silversmiths, you know, for the Temple of Diana, these men had a sweetheart deal with the government and the local religious establishment to make these silver shrines and silver trinkets, and they, they got rich off of doing this. And when Paul comes into town preaching against idolatry, that takes a big chunk out of their market. Uh-huh. And so they trump up a conspiracy and they they drag him before the courts and try to get him thrown out of town huh. or executed. I'm not I can't remember exactly, but he's he's saved at the last minute by uh, some kind of officials. And, uh, you know, he gets out through various means. But you can see the same thing in when uh, uh, one of the Herods kills James. And it says it made the Jews happy, so he started to try to do more. He arrested Peter. And there's this story where Herod comes, and he presents himself before uh, the people, and he's wearing the silver robes, and it says his voice was like a god, and it's where he's struck down by the Mm -hmm. angel. Well, that story begins by saying that the people he was talking to were from a, a neighboring region, who liked Herod because their country was nourished by the king's country. Uh. Okay, so here's a wealth redistribution scheme that the government is using in order to keep an entire population in favor with him. Uh. And you see this all through the books of Acts, that this is how pagan kings keep control of things, and the Christians are supposed to stay out of it. The Christians are supposed to, to preach the truth and preach the gospel to it. And uh, you see that in many places. And now, what is the flip side of this? Because here's the here's an objection a lot of your listeners will will have, and it's a legitimate one. What about all the poor people that are going to fall through the cracks? 
You can't just pull up the public school system and leave all the people who can't afford private schools to go fend for themselves. Well, that's right. So without a system of charity in place already, a means to educate those people through the church, through trade uh, outreaches, through all kinds of civic affairs, that is a legitimate problem. Hmm. And that's the thing. If we don't have the free alternatives to do it, we can't we can't get rid of socialism. And that means if the church doesn't rise up and do it, who will? Huh. You know. And so I look at uh, some of these narratives in the Book of Acts. Uh, Christian people who advocate socialist policies will often look at Acts four and five, where they sold their properties in Jerusalem right. and handed off the proceeds distributed it evenly to everyone who had need. Hmm. And they say, aha, there's socialism. And I say, aha, there is not socialism because the state <laughs> is not the one doing it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, but but the, the flip side that is a criticism of us in the body of Christ today is the fact that they were actually doing it. Right. And our churches don't. Today, our churches, 80% or more of their budgets go to pay for buildings and pastor salaries, mm -hmm. you know, instead of actually taking care of the needs of the people in the body and making outreaches for others and educational programs and helping people homeschool or private school their children and a whole list of other things. You know, Paul specifically says in 1 Timothy 5 to have a welfare program for the retired widows who can't work anymore. Okay, now I know most churches have some kind of an emergency fund to help the poor, but how many of them have an actual welfare program for their elderly members? Right. And I would say for the most part, not one. Yeah. Um, and but, but, okay, this isn't a matter of opinion. This isn't a matter of you're a socialist or a capitalist or whatever. This is a matter of a direct commandment from Paul to the church. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so why why don't we preach that and emphasize it? Mm. But instead, when our retirees become old, we send them to the state and mm. Social Security. Mm. That's their safety net. Yeah. So that you know, it takes a mindset change on behalf of the Christians, and that's why you know when I wrote that book, yes, all these Christian socialist ideas mm. like Campolo and Ron Sider and Jim Wallace, all those guys, their their erroneous notions need to be debunked. Uh -huh. However, the one thing they're doing that the rest of the church is not is they're actually meeting the need or they're trying to meet the need. And that is always their starting point. Who's going to take care of the poor? Who's going to help the homeless? Who's going to help the AIDS victims? Who's going to help this or that? And that's where we fail because huh. we pass them all off to the state. Uh -huh. And in doing so, the conservative churches are justifying the welfare state just as much as the leftist theologians are who advocate for it explicitly. Okay. Because they, we won't put up anything to, to meet those needs ourselves privately. And that is the key. If we don't have a private alternative, the pagans will sweep in and fill the void. And that was all, is what has always gone on, and it will always continue to go on. Uh, so that's that's become my message now is a lot of the focus in that book where it was critiquing the liberals. I have now turned to to being a message to the church. If you don't change, you will suffer the judgment. And that has been true all through history and it will continue to be true. So we need social action. We need proper worldview and we need to put them together. Hmm. So. Right, correct. Th th there's another thing that I definitely wanted to discuss, which is uh, you mentioned up Acts four and five, and you mentioned well, it's not the state that is you know that is uh, having everybody come in and uh, you know redistribute their possessions and belongings, but there's also uh, the other aspect of Ananias and Sapphira who uh, lied uh, to to the apostles, and how they even said, um, oh, the apostle said that uh, you know what wasn't what you had yours and so mm -hmm. and, and i definitely want you to talk about that specifically because i think that that kind of brings up another aspect to that to, to sort of that objection towards us uh in regards to socialism <clears throat> no doubt the socialist argument has always been there that because they were selling these properties and distributing the wealth that that is kind of a 
they wouldn't say mandatory, I don't think, but the expected ethic for Christians. Correct. That you sell your riches and give everything you have to distribute to those who have need. And that was not what was going on. And mm-hmm. there are actually a couple of layers to that. I'll I'll say the one you're asking about first, and then I'll back up and give another part of it. Sure. But the 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 main one is Peter explicitly tells Ananias and Sapphira, wasn't it yours to do what you wanted with before you sold it? Mm-hmm. And he says, even after you sold it, was the money not yours to do what you wanted with? Yeah. Okay. So they were not punished for not giving everything. They were punished for lying about what they gave. Yeah. And and uh, there's actually more theologically going on there I'm going to be writing about soon, but that's enough to get the point across here. Mm-hmm. Peter explicitly tells them, even after you bought it, the money was yours, and you can do what you wanted with it. You didn't have to give any of it. But uh, the other layer behind all of this is it wasn't just a philanthropic, philanthropic uh, attitude that just overcame the Christians and they started selling all their property and giving everything they had to the poor. Keep in mind, this is taking place in Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. In the first century, the the disciples had just a couple months prior to this sat at the feet of Jesus who said, do you see this temple? Not one block is going to be left upon another. And yeah. he gives them the Olivet Discourse prophecy saying that this entire city is going to be destroyed. Everything in it is going to be burned. Everything's going to be leveled. And not one block is going to remain standing. Right. Well, if you if you really believed what Jesus said, and he said this is going to happen in this generation. So if you really believed what Jesus said, and you owned property in Jerusalem, what would you want to do? You would want to sell it and get out of town. Uh-huh. And so these first century Christians who owned property in Jerusalem had no problem whatsoever selling that property. (laughs) They wanted to get out as soon as possible because they believed what he said. And Mm -hmm. sure enough, it happened in AD 70 that the whole city was destroyed. So uh, yes, but, but then again, yes, they did distribute proceeds to those who had need. Mm -hmm. Um, But, but there was a whole lot more to that story overall is especially in regards to the future they were looking for. Right as they were leaving that city and what was coming in the future. So right. um, very interesting stuff, and it always has been. Right. And and going back to the Old Testament, in the tithing, was that by co- uh, coercion? I have never thought that it was by coercion. I believe it was a command from God, mm-hmm. and you were required to do it morally from God. But if you didn't do it, there was no civil agency that could come around mm-hmm. and and collect it was not a tax in that sense. Right. There was nobody who c- could come demand it from you or confiscate it from you if you didn't pay, and nobody could take your property if you didn't pay. Okay. So it was a voluntary honor system, and people knew. I mean, if you truly believed in God and believed what he said, they would do it. And, and in many cases, they did do it. Now, when there is a story in the Scripture when they come back from captivity under Ezra and Nehemiah, that they reinstitute the tithe of the land and they do send out agents to go collect. Hmm. But it does not say that they had the authority to take it if people were unwilling. And even if it did, I mean, that would be uh, something that Nehemiah and Ezra had come up with, not anything that had been prescribed in the law of God. It was just a matter of uh, convenience to get the job done Hmm. Um, or maybe some kind of, you know, little persuasion. But uh, there was no coercive aspect to it. There was certainly no civil government aspect to it. So, uh, however, what we've done is we've replaced that with a modern secularized version called taxation. <laughs> yeah. And, and and they can take your property. They can confiscate your funds. They can raid your bank account, et cetera. Here in the podcast, we're talking about uh, private property and uh, the government being able to tax your private property. Uh, my grandmother, she had owned uh, her house, fully paid off, and uh, the taxes that she was paying uh, were ridiculous, and there were 
towards the school <laughs> that was yep. here. And it frustrated her at the end of the year. I mean, it, it really put a really big burden on her. And uh, I remember looking at some of the documents myself, and I said, wow, that's, that's, a, that's a lot of taxes. And to where it was going to, I was like, she doesn't attend the university here, or you know, she doesn't got any hospital bills. Uh, and yeah, I mean, just the, the idea of taxation, you know, we're running short on time here, but that's, uh, mm-hmm. that's definitely an interesting topic. Um, but Joel, is there anything else, any other objections we're already landing the plane here on the podcast that uh, you would kind of like to address, uh, you know, besides uh, Acts 4 and 5, the the tide, as well as uh, God's law and the uh, Ten Commandments? Is there anything else that, that you would want to unpack, just for clarity? No, I mean, and obviously if people can read the book, and there's right. a ton more in there, especially in regard to critiquing the Christian socialists that I've mentioned. Mm-hmm. But uh, I would also read Restoring America after that, which is kind of the positive statement on what to do after the critique. But uh, adding anything on the topic, there, there's so much in there in regard to the history, right. in regard to what the Bible teaches, that we really need to get in tune with. And two things i would say one of them is don't be shocked by how radical it sounds at first Mm -hmm. the more you study scripture the more you will realize it's true and the shock is in how far we've actually come and how far we've let ourselves to accept it as a status quo Mm -hmm. that that is the socialistic schemes okay and uh, you know i would certainly say that and then i would also say um you've got to apply this to yourself the churches mm-hmm. need to apply this to themselves. We need to look at this in the in the terms of not can we shut down the people that support Obama. The, the The question is, can the body of Christ do what it's supposed to do and create a free society and create free alternatives? Hmm. And that's really what Restoring America is all about. It's uh, you know ten ten areas of lives where we study those concepts. So, but we need to apply that to ourselves. This needs to hit home, and we need to be harder on conservatives. Like the scripture says, the judgment begins at the house of God. Mm-hmm. We need to start there. Why are our kids in public schools? Why do we tolerate that status quo of property taxation, 70% of which goes to public education? Mm-hmm. Why do we uh, just roll over? in the social security and medicare systems and just let it go why don't we have an organized alternative to it right uh, health is one area where we've already done this uh with like samaritan ministries and christian health shares and many other companies you can get completely out of government health care systems mm. and have a completely privately funded alternative by christians mm. and the rates you'll be shocked go way down in many cases because you keep out the smokers and you keep out all the things that add to much of the overhead huh. in the larger pools so i mean the, there are alternatives out there already being created and we need to leverage that mindset for a lot of things and perhaps reading this book god versus socialism will alert people to a lot of the places where wow we've already come a long long way and and then start asking well okay what can we do to start changing some of this yeah 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 i mean if the like we just talked about right now the whole idea of 10 (laughs) percent that's crazy man (laughs) whenever you whenever you mentioned that i was it just made me chuckle man so yeah that's definitely how far we have come um joel uh where where can our listeners uh find you at absolutely well i'm the president of american vision we're at americanvision.org and uh, I have a podcast now on YouTube called The yep. Devoted Word. I have it's also on iTunes and many other places. And uh, but AmericanVision.org is our main website, and you can find our store there, links directly from the site, and many many other resources. I put up an article or some kind of material almost every day. Yeah. Yeah, how much do you write, by the way? Because I've noticed that you publish a lot of stuff. I, I mean, I, I follow you guys on Facebook, and for my, our listeners, go follow them on Facebook as well. But uh, yeah, I've noticed yeah. you you write a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've never kept track of it, but daily articles, anywhere from a thousand to two or three thousand words, go up multiple times a week. Wow. And so, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of five to ten thousand words a week goes up. Whew from me so you know that could be a book in a matter of six months just the <laughs> articles and then i write books on top of that so I, right you know it's it's one of those things you do what you do and when you're gifted to do something you do it so i write right right all right joel well hey thank you for coming on the program you can just hold for just a minute um all right guys so that was uh the uh our topic for today 
Um, please stay tuned for next week. We got Matt Slick coming on. We're going to be talking about Mormonism. It's our first podcast ever with Mormonism, and uh, Matt Slick's a uh, friend and brother of the ministry. Uh, great, great guy. But uh, as always, uh, what is your comfort in life and in death? Uh, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And we will see you on the next podcast. Thank you and see you later.